Hello and welcome back to yet another episode of Green and White brought to you by Argo Life. A single from an Englishman, a double from a Scotsman and a triple save from a Northern Irishman. It's starting to sound like a walks into the bar joke. For the first time in our lives, we're delighted that Foster's is on tap. Initially, it was Argyle downing their sorrows. Phillips putting the ball back into the mixer with Perry NG sinking the opportunity. However, Bullet must see the errors of his ways after changing shape at half time, which allowed Argyle, pre mixed with new signings for Shaw and Divine, to get their cocktails up. Both decided defending wasn't really for them as Ryan Hardy quickly sank a double, his first with the smoothest elegance of a fine Scottish whiskey the gentlest of touches enough to guide it home before choosing to pack a knockout blow, smashing home his second. It was soon to be Cardiff's round again, but Connor Hazard fended off a triple of shots. A single Captain Morgan's was the final tipple of the day, and it was Cardiff who were on the rocks, as their fans were the latest to boo their own side off at Fortress Home Park. Joining me in this week's round is the designated driver that is Joe Bell. How's things? Delivered with perfection. Yeah. Please drink responsibly. Yeah, I didn't mess that up too much. Um, they won't know that anyway because I've had the other bits that I did. Uh, the pre-mixed cocktail cam that is Ben. How's things? Hola, amigos. Yeah, I've been promoted to the top top corner of the screen. Awesome. You don't normally sit up there. Um, and the drunk and disorderly Sam down. How's things? Uh, I'm consulting my lawyers as we speak. <laughs> things are very good, thank you. Much better yeah. after yesterday. Good. So now, whilst, whilst you're on and you're unmuted, why don't you run us through, do your customary uh, match run through of yesterday's... yesterday's yeah. Saturday. Yeah, yesterday at the time of recording. Um, I thought the first 20 minutes we offered absolutely nothing. Um, admittedly, um, I've seen some comments after the game that actually the first 20 weren't so bad because our defending was quite good apart from for their goal. And yeah, I think that's not entirely unreasonable. Cardiff did not have chance after chance in that time, but they still had one big chance due to a defensive error at our end. And um, we offered really nothing at all playing it out um, that I can recall. Uh, so the first 20 were, were very tepid, very uninspiring. Um, if you want to divide it into the, the halves of the half, if you like, the second half of the first half was a lot better. Um, still not brilliant, but but much better. We got a bit more control of the game. We managed to work the ball into dangerous areas a bit more. Hardy led it with a good pass to Whitaker, who I think had a shot saved or blocked. One of the two, I can't quite remember. But then Hardy himself found the equalising goal shortly after. Um, and we, we just had our, had our tails up or our cocktails up, as Aaron would have it. We, we had them up going into half time. Um, and, and I think we, we kind of thought, you know, if we can just up the tempo, up the energy a bit, we'll. We, we we could very easily win this. And yeah, what followed was one of the best halves of football all season, home or away, um, completely controlled, completely dominant. Um, they barely had the ball in our penalty area, apart from the hazard incident. I'm not quite sure I'm having it as a, a triple save because one of them is definitely a punch, but it was still, you know, a fine bit of goalkeeping. Um it's not a triple. It doesn't work for the intro, so it must be. No, that's that's true. That's true. But it's not just um, there. I've, you know, I've seen triple save <laughs> all over Twitter, and my inner pedant is, is saying that the middle one was definitely a, a punch away. But it was a very good punch uh, and 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 two good saves uh, in the mix of that as well. So that you know, I think they say it's a sign of a good keeper that if you're not called upon too often to to be alert when you are and have that after having absolutely nothing to do for about. Um, you know, the entire um, maybe 30, 35 minutes before and the entire time after was, was absolutely on his marks in that incident. Um, yeah, Ryan Hardy with an absolutely sublime turn and finish to make it 2-1, aided by Cardiff defending, giving him pretty much all the space in Central Park. But we'll take the, we'll take the help where we can get it from the defensive errors. And then Hardy lays it on a plate for Whitaker for the third goal that sealed the game. Um, yeah, that second half was fantastic, apart from that one counter-attack in which Hazard was aptly called upon. Cardiff offered zero threat during that half. Uh, we were defensively sturdy and exciting going forward. And look, it is early days. It, it is only Cardiff who are on a very poor run of form. 
Um, so I'm not going to, you know, go get too over the top just yet. But blimey, if there's a way that we can combine the, um, you know, attacking um, dynamism going forward that was previously there and just add a bit more game control to it, a bit more solidity to it. If that if that's the case, what a great manager uh, or great head coach Foster could could well turn out to be. Um, I thought the game management of that game was was perfect. A um, couple of silly yellow cards, if I'm being a bit critical. One for descent, one for a pretty shocking dive. Um, oh, and and one for getting into a bit of handbags with another player. So, so three li- little individual instances of of you know silliness, shall we say, that got yellow cards. But apart from that. As a team, as a collective, our shape was brilliant. Our intent was brilliant. Um, knowing when to bomb forward, knowing when to drop back was all all fantastic. That second half really grew into the game. And I think of his 180-odd appearances in the green shirt, I don't think you'll find a finer one from Ryan Hardy than the one he put in. I thought he was fantastic. Not only did he get two goals, not only did he get one assist and could even have been another assist if Whitaker had found the finish in the first half. Um he was just brilliant throughout those two lost causes from Chase Down in about the 86th and 87th minute when he started from about 10 yards behind the player after running, you know, running his backside off all game were were incredible. And, and a, a round of applause he got from that from the Home Park faithful for both those incidences was, was fully deserved. Fantastic, fantastic performance from him. Um, good from Whitaker. He, he kind of goes under the radar. Maybe we'll, we'll talk about it a bit more later on, but it goes under the radar. He just had a golden assist, and that's just like a normal game for him. But yeah, really good for him. Really good from Connor Hazard. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think anybody had a bad game. I'm just very, that first 20 minutes needs a lot of work. But apart from that, very, very impressed. You stopped at a perfect time there. Go on, Joe, follow it up. I don't think there's going to be time for a ref watcher. If, if there's anything you want to say about Mr whoever from whatever sheer chuck it in now uh yeah i mean i i wasn't at the game so i've had the benefit of a, a full replay post game um to to see it and um i can sort of understand what sam's saying i think the first 20 25 minutes we were just a little bit tentative um whether or not that was down to the all the new faces being thrown in all at once or not i'm not sure um you know, I, I don't imagine Cardiff have had it any easier, but obviously it should be noted. I don't think we've trained on grass all week either because of just how cold it's been down here and, um, you know, training on 4G and then going straight onto grass for a game isn't an ideal preparation. Although, you know, I think with the way the current climate is in this country nowadays, we're going to have to get used to that being a norm during the winter. Um but I, I totally agree with his sentiments for the next hour of the game, really. Um, I thought that was a controlled attacking performance, if there is such a phrase. Um, it wasn't gung-ho, throw every iron into the fire um, like it was under the previous two regimes when, you're in, when you know you're on top in a game and you're better than the opposition. I think it was more measured. Um, and there was a structure about how we attacked that perhaps we didn't see under... Stephen Schumacher. Um, you know, you've got to remember it's a very small sample size. It's come up against an incredibly physical Huddersfield who went long at almost every opportunity they could. Um, and it's come up against a Cardiff side who, I mean, they're blighted with almost every issue a squad can be dealt with at the moment. They've got injury, suspensions, illness. The manager didn't sound overly hopeful post game that he's going to be able to get reinforcements in before their next league game. Um, because they get a weekend off this weekend. So um, Cardiff offered very little. Whilst we were passive in the first 20 minutes, I thought they were very fortunate to even take the lead because they weren't really... They were having a lot of the ball, um, but they weren't doing anything with it. Um, And that was really the case for them all game. Um, They did have spells of possession, but there was never really a a threat there. Um, They were as toothless a side as we've played in a little while. Um, So you do have to take that into consideration when you're talking about, you know, just how structured we've been the last two games. I was very fortunate to be at Huddersfield last weekend. um, So I got to see Fozzie's first league game firsthand. And I thought I was really impressed that day with just how quickly he'd he'd got the defensive structure sorted. I mean, we didn't really allow Huddersfield any opportunities in that game really inside the box. They had a few efforts from outside, but it was all 
all from range and from distance. Um, you know, the only criticism you had that day was we didn't, we weren't really the ones carrying a threat, but we we more than made up for that. Uh, just very quickly on the referee, want to praise him for getting the Mikhail Miller penalty shout right. Um, it, it's a it's a pretty poor dive from Mikhail, to be honest with you. Um, I also want to. I, what, then I want to give a little moan to the fact that he booked Phillips and Mate for that little coming together on the touchline. I mean, there's just nothing in it. Just get on with it. It's not even handbags. It doesn't even qualify as handbags. They're just tussling with each other. Don't, you didn't even have to have a word with them at that point. Um, and there were numerous incidents where he, he allowed players to advance four or five yards up the pitch for throw-ins. Um, but it's all very superficial in the grand scheme of things. Um, but the, the big takeaway is just how quickly Foster has... Not turned it around, but just how quickly he's he's shored things up a little bit at the back. I think Ben's probably going to have a, a load of stats that he's going to throw at us in a second about XGs and against and all this nonsense that's all a load of poppycock, if you ask me. I don't believe in XG. I think it's a load of nonsense. I think we're more likely to, to have gone to the moon in the 60s or whatever it was than we had XGs to actually be a true reflection of a team's performance. Um, but... You know, if you do subscribe to those stats, and there are some very well-known um, public figures on other platforms who do subscribe totally to those stats, and I think they go and say Mass and receive Holy Communion from XG every Sunday, um, they will tell us that we are a lot more solid at the back than we have been, um, and it's a step forward in the right direction. So I think what is clear, and I say it to these guys in our in our group chats that we have, that... It's very clear Foster's MO, his modus operandi, since he's come in, it's not been to implement a free-flowing attacking style of football or what have you. His first job is to stop us conceding goals because we have conceded a lot of goals. Yes, all right, in the last five home games, we've scored three in every one of those five. We've also conceded quite a few in those last five home games. And it was very clear at Huddersfield that we did go there looking to improve the away record and i don't imagine that his style of play away from home is going to change anytime soon because until that away record improves then we're just going to make it harder for ourselves with the caliber of teams that are coming to home park so his his um early vision is working i think we're all seeing signs of that and if he as sam touched on himself you know if he can temper free flow nature of other teams against us if we can sure ourselves up and make us more solid whilst also continuing to play the brand of football we did in the second half yesterday i think the second half of the season could be a lot of fun as we um try and steer ourselves to finish at least in 15th place which surely listening to how ambitious fozzy is after the game um you know i think his 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 mo is now to catch cardiff and then it will be to catch bristol city and then it would be to catch preston um it's not to look over our shoulders all oh, we're nine points clear of qpr it's right how many points are the team above so um it's a nice way to look at it he's showing all the positive signs that we wanted straight away and um over to Ben now to eulogise over XGs and nonsense. Sorry, can, can we have a bit more on the, on the moon landing, please? Is that going to be content for a bonus part? <laughs> I'm intrigued to hear James Field from the moon landing now. I, I subscribe <laughs> more to the fact that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon than I am that XG is a true reflection of a team's ability. I think it's all a load of bloody nonsense. Y yes, but you're still saying that as if Neil Armstrong having walked on the moon was unlikely, which is an implication I'm interested in explore, but perhaps, perhaps not for this pod. If, if people want to hear my thoughts on, on NASA's expeditions into extraterrestrial world, then I'm sure we can release a bonus pod. But um, unfortunately, we're now going to have to hear about XGs, I fear. And Aaron said he didn't want to have to... Uh to edit this pod very much. We'd rather talk about the first 24. He can keep in the fact that I subscribe more to the fact that we've been <laughs> to the moon than XG is a true reflection of a team's ability. I don't care about that whatsoever. In, in the first 25 minutes, Cardiff pushed their, 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 what, their wing backs, I suppose, full backs up on ours, on, on Miller and on um, Mumba. And that stopped, you know, when they're pinned back, that means that the four in the middle, that is the two front foot, the two middle forwards and the two holding midfielders can't then advance into the, from the, from the first third through the middle to the, to the final third. So when we were getting, having to get clear the ball, everyone was stuck back in the, 
defensive formation and it wasn't sticking. Now, when, when that was happening, Cardiff were able to use the ball, pass it around, and they weren't doing much with it. But yes, I can understand people's frustrations that we weren't holding on to the ball. Around half an hour into the game, 25 minutes, 30 minutes into the game, one of, well, two things happened. I'm not quite sure which came first, but everyone seemed to be getting on the, the same wavelength as each other. But also, Galloway started stepping out from defence. And as soon as Galloway started stepping out of defence, it completely eradicated their numerical advantage and it allowed everyone else to go with him into the spaces that he was, that, that was being vacated by those that had been pressing up. So they lost their, they didn't outnumber us anymore. And that was the trigger for all of a sudden the midfield to start working as it ought, which is getting up the pitch, that four in the middle as a narrow four up in support of Hardy. That was what allowed us to then start putting our foot on the ball because they realised that if they were going to um, swamp the middle, that Galloway could come forward, uh, as he did quite effectively on a couple of occasions, uh, and, and progress the ball that way. And that was much easier for us than passing it out, which is why I think Bullet changed the formation because that was just going to be a very easy out every time we got the ball at the back. Uh, we could give it to Galloway and allow him to, he seemed quite comfortable coming forward. He didn't meet much resistance. Uh, and that's why Bullet changed the formation. And that ultimately didn't do them any favours, but I don't think they'd fared any better once once we'd worked that out. Now, if it was Galloway doing that, either of his own initiative or because the manager said, look, you start doing this because we're getting outnumbered in the middle, I'm not sure. Um, and whether it was him doing that first that sort of settled everybody down or everyone started to settle down and then he was able to to start playing with a bit more confidence and comfort because everyone was settling in, I don't know. But, um, you know, games don't, you know, one team doesn't dominate a game for 90 minutes, or at least very, very rarely. And the idea that, you know, we were rubbish in that half an hour just isn't true. We They came out with a game plan that worked very well against the setup we had we had four players sort of haven't played more than than one game together. One who'd sort of not, it only had really one half training session with the rest of the team. So they were getting used to each other and then um, dealing with, with the opposition tactics. I feel like the idea that that was a bad half hour of football when actually we were getting to grips with the opposition tactics and within half an hour had worked them out and overcame them without any real threat. The only threat being the set piece, which Phillips really should have done a lot better with. Um, and that Cardiff are are prone to score those sort of opportunities from from open play. They produce very little. So I kind of you know it, I think it's very reductive to say that was a bad half hour when in fact it was you know a part of football where you have to you know play what's in front of you and adapt to to that. As for XG it's slander, um, I don't think you can really draw any conclusions from two games, especially against um, two. I mean, Cardiff are a good side. You know, I, I saw they, they've scored 35 goals this season. More than, a you know, Sunderland have scored 37, West Brom have scored 40. So they can score. Um, it's not like they're a bad side um, going forward. They just, as they demonstrated, I think, at times where they're not very good at the back. And um, that, you know, we were able to exploit that. Um, let's, but let's I don't think you quickly, can draw... Yeah? Very quickly, just to point out, three of their goals... They've scored three goals against us this season. One of them we've passed into our own net and the other one has hit our own man from a corner and it's just fallen to a man who's about four yards out. So whilst I accept that they can score goals, they've not really showcased... And the other one was a, just a thunder strike from the edge of the box. So I accept they probably can score goals, but they've not shown it against us that they're a decent side to me personally. Yeah, we, we battered Norwich 6-2 and they've also you know proved that they can play quite well. You can't, that's, that's the whole point of statistics. The point I was just about to make is you can't draw conclusions from one or two games. You can cherry pick anything to support an argument on that basis. And that's what I'm going to say. You can't pick XG from two games against Huddersfield and Cardiff who are, Cardiff, even though they, like I say, they've scored, are not in a, they're in an awful run of form and Huddersfield are just, they're just awful, aren't they? Um, although they're defensively pretty, pretty, Solid, you know, they um, the new manager, you know, Moore's I say he's new, he's not new now, is it? Sort of 20 odd games he's had, um, yeah, but they, they, they're all right defensively, but the, neither of them are teams which I think you want to extrapolate from. And I think the next sort of five games, Swansea are looking a little bit better under Williams, Sunderland, I don't know, they're a good team, but Beal seems to have them going backwards. But then that three, that run of three at home, I think, after this, the next five league games, um, because I'm sure we'll discuss what we're going to do at Leeds potentially, I don't know, but. Uh, the next five league games will give us a much clearer idea and a much bigger 
sample size to sort of analyze XG and associated um, data. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's any, any point. I'll make sure I'm washing my hair that night. Well, I mean, we are 20 odd minutes in um, and Phil Jill's suggestion of uh, any chance we can make it a bit shorter. You might get more listeners who don't have so much time uh, sort of gone out the window. Uh, Phil's dog walk is between 52 and 59 minutes. So that would be great. Um, I think that's gone, um, as has my Mac by all accounts, because it's frozen. So if you can hear me, um, we're doing pretty well. A couple of full time thoughts. Paul Burke says, uh, Fosball is a work in progress. I don't like sitting off teams at home like we did in the first 30. Better after the break with more urgency on the ball. Uh, and without Hardy was immense. Best player by a mile. For sure on Phillips, good. We'll get on to those. Um, other newbies are mixed. Shouldn't have started all four. Uh, Tom Harrison didn't think either side were fantastic in that first half. Uh, whatever was said at halftime for us worked and completely dominated the midfield from the restart. Uh, for sure is exactly what we've been looking for. Clinical from us. Great to see Hardy amongst the goals again. Dan says a game of two half. Strange first seems disjointed with Hardy isolated. Second half a lot better. Divine had good moments, a promise uh, with, a, with an assist and, and JV was good. Huge three points with our next fixtures in QPR winning. Wayne over Bundu on the sub again shows Fozzie's preference there. We'll get up to that as well. Mark Sanders says doubters do not achieve. Skeptics do not contribute. Cynics do not create. Uh, amazing how many who slag them off uh, so far, love the new guys already. I'm just, let's, let's get on to the new guys then. Uh, I have to switch apps on my phone. All the questions I was going to ask you about tactically and setups and stats and stuff, I think you've covered. And obviously, Divine and Forshaw were thrust straight into the starting lineup. Uh, starting with a the former, then Sam. Uh, Forshaw's last game came for Norwich in, in October, coming in a 3 1 defeat away to Sunderland. Uh, how did you evaluate our goal debut after? Yes, well, that was his last league game. He did play for Norwich in the FA Cup, which is why he's now cup tied. Um, when we go to Leeds on Saturday, um, I think his Rovers doesn't count. Yeah, I think his performance was reflective of ours in the sense that I think the first twenty he he didn't offer much at all. And whilst I do take Ben's point about no one's going to dominate the entirety of the game, I still think there was just so many sloppy moments whereby there were easy passes out that we just didn't take. So I'm, I'm still going to stick to my guns a little on the first 20, um, despite Ben's valid point to an extent. Um, I think Forshaw in that first 20 was one of the worst culprits. He was quite lax on the ball, quite careless on the ball. But w when he got up to the pace of the game, when he got a bit more energy into his legs, he, he, he was really good. He, he was composed. He was calm. Um, he sort of knew when to play the ball, knew when to slow it down, knew when to wait for, for men to run into space. He, yeah, demonstrated good judgment with the ball demonstrated good judgment in the defensive sense as well. He would often just drop in and intercept. Um, sort of reminded me a little bit of David Fox back in the day. I know that was very different because with David Fox, he would, his primary role was a deep line playmaker um, and sort of let the, let the guys in front of him do the heavy lifting with regard to defensive pressing. But, both, both um, of them are Norwich legends as well, so... Yeah, both of them Norwich legends, but but a bit like David Fox in, in the sense of just know, knowing when to just drop in and intercept, um, and and then know, just knowing when to knowing which balls to play and, and how quickly to play it, which I think are all very valuable skills. Um, I think him and Randall could could be a good partnership um, at some point. N nothing against JB, but I, I would like to see those two together at some stage. Um, yeah, really grew into the game. We're going to have to be a bit careful. We're going to have to manage his minutes. Obviously, he's not going to be able to play now for another couple of weeks anyway because he is cup tied. But yeah, I think he could just get that bit of leadership, bit of calmness, bit of know-how that we really need to add some solidity to our midfield. Yeah, I didn't think about that. We'll get on to Leeds in a, in a separate um, Leeds preview pod, which, which, dear listener, you can you can hear on uh, Friday, I believe it will come out. But I didn't actually think of Forshaw being cup tied. So obviously, JB won't be able to play against his parent club. So we're going to have a new midfield again. Um, ben, same question for you, but with Divine then. How do you evaluate his Argyle debut? Yeah, I saw a lot of people saying that Divine was quite passive and, and sort of didn't do much. And I. So I I did I wasn't at the game I should have been I had other commitments so I I saw the like the meltdown on Twitter and then sort of the second half was praised much more and then I heard um, Foster's comments afterwards where he said he thought we'd done quite well and I thought oh please don't be one of those sort of managers who just chats nonsense and sort of says yeah we were brilliant when we clearly weren't 
Um, and then, I, so I, I then watched the first half hour and religiously took notes on every clear mistake, every positive um, effort, etc. Devine was all over the place. He was doing all sorts. Within the first two minutes and 40 seconds of the game, he'd already closed down a man and forced a, a, a misplaced pass to turn over possession and picked up the ball and driven at the defender to commit the defender, which gave space to Miller, which he then played the ball out to Miller and Miller didn't make the most of the opportunity. Um, and, he, and he pretty much carried on in that vein for the, for, for the whole game. He He was good in the air. When he was called on, he harried people relentlessly. He he forced at least three clear turnovers. Um, and he did make a lot of mistakes. He misplaced passes. Um, he maybe dallied too long. He's getting used to the t- his teammates. And, you know, making mistakes doesn't invalidate the good things that you do. You know, you can go through a whole game and make no mistakes. And all you do is pay, play little sideways passes to the other Centre backs, or you know, or pass the ball to your midfield partner and do nothing. And technically, you've made no mistake, but you've not necessarily had an impact on the game. But I thought Divine was brilliant. The little lofted lift over the top to Hardy that um, was the phase before the first goal was wonderfully weighted pass. You know, completely cut out the defence. And then he he you know, after about twenty two minutes, there's a wonderful demonstration of his ability when the ball was played down the right, um, and and sort of like. The ball was was played to Hardy. Hardy. Hardy tried to flick it to him. The defender intercepted it, and the beam sort of muscled the defender off. You know, he's a young guy. He's a he's a midfielder. He's not a big lump to, going up against central defenders. But he muscled the guy off the ball and then recycled the ball. I think he did really well. And yes, like I say, he did make mistakes, but I think they were more than outweighed by um, his positive inputs. Um, you know, I don't think the the assist was was incredible, but he he had to go out, get the ball, drive in. You know, be decisive. Did well with that. Um, yeah, I mean, other than JB, he was the one I was most impressed with. This, considering it's his first game, yeah, was, was, was very hopeful that he can continue to to improve. I definitely don't think he was sort of passive or or, or anonymous as has been suggested. I think if you had to get, go back and actually just watch him and see the impact he's having, you know, even when it's just harrying someone, they might make they might complete their pass, etc. But I think he had a really um, positive impact on the game, you know, in 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 the second and the third third of the pitch Joe moving on to you then just just to quote yourself back to you um you can't be anything other than excited about these new signings can you yeah very good am I talking about the two who made their debut uh yesterday or am I um I made the comment that I'm not sure I've seen a more impressive debut about Ashley Phillips I, I should caveat that I was quite a few pints and a few um, whiskey and Cokes down last Saturday night when I tweeted that. But I do stand by it. I think, you know, the two games I've seen of him have been very impressed. Um, I'm not quite going to come out with a Lewis Gibson-esque statement about him just yet because I still think he's got a little way to go before he reaches that level. I know a good friend of mine, Josh, um, tried to bait me with that before he came on tonight. So um, not happening. Um, But yeah, I mean, look, Darko JB was a lot... He looked a lot more assured this week. He certainly had more of an impact on this week's game than he did at Huddersfield. Um, but then he was fresh to the side last week. He, you know, similar to Adam Forshaw. I think he probably only had half a session, if that, with the players before we played Huddersfield. So it was a little bit tricky for him then. Um, I agree with what Ben said about Alfie Devine. Um, you know, it, it was a, a really pleasing first appearance in a green shirt for him. Um, you know, we could have. Could have done with him not being cup tied, I think. But, you know, and Adam Forshaw, I mean, I've not really, I'm quite happy to go on record. I've never really been one to subscribe to this idea that you you need this experienced championship head. Um, I was one of very few in this group who probably didn't subscribe to that theory. But look, I mean, we've brought Forshaw in. You can see why in that first game that he's played for us. Um, it's not a slight on Jordan Houghton whatsoever um, that we've gone out and got that got Adam for sure because they're going to complement each other brilliantly by the amount they'll both play between now and the end of the season for sure hasn't been brought in to start the next 17 18 games however many we've got left um for sure has been brought in to be a another part of the leadership group that Foster's talked about in the last a lot in the last 48 72 hours so uh he wanted that sort of character around he was very good in the game 
um, yesterday, and you would think he's going to be very crucial in games such as Swansea away, Coventry at home, Leeds at home, West Brom at home, those sorts of games are where he's going to really, we're going to see the bread and butter of him. So all in all, four really good signings from what we've seen. Um, you know, whilst it was always going to be difficult to replace Finners as this month, I'm not sure we're going to be able to replace Finners as this month. I think that's a job for the summer. Um, but certainly in terms of, you know, improving the squad, um, you know, I don't think we can say off the limited evidence we've got from the four players that we've signed that we've weakened the squad in any way. You know, they've they've more than... We've, yeah, but we haven't seen Sorinola, have we, Aaron? So I'm saying the limited evidence on what we've seen. OK, I'll just say we've signed five. You know, pay attention for Christ's oh, sake. Sorinola looks um, very lively and active. Looks like he's... I'm, I'm sure he does him. when he's running around like a lunatic at full time. It's an improvement... On what we had, um, they've not weakened the squad one bit. They come in and they've brought different energy um, and different characteristics to the side. So um, I still think we're a striker short. Um, I've maintained that since the summer transfer window ended and I want that addressed before the end of the month. From what, you know, the doom and gloom that was on Twitter 10 days ago and you'd have thought the sky was caving in. You know, I wasn't one who was, you know, striking the doomsday clock on what was going on. I was frustrated with what was going on, but there's a plan, there's a process. You all laughed at me. Well, I have to say, you aren't laughing now, are you? Oh, brilliant. You're ticking off a lot of... <laughs> I'm just going to move on. Um, ben, I think you're the only person not to mention this chicken licking, skies falling in, um, Twitter, doom. Yeah, I, I, I had a question about Ashley Phillips. I don't think we need to go over that moment of madness. We'll let him off. He looked pretty solid after that. Uh, we'll get on to... It should, it should be noted, I think, with Ashley Phillips, his positioning and his, his passing is excellent. Um, oh, yeah, he set up Perry and perfectly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know how he missed that. Um, I, w I won't go into it, but oh. he, maybe he was unsighted. I don't he know quite. Um, but yeah, it's just bizarre. Um, but he he's not brilliant in the air. He you know before he came, I think it was thirty eight percent was quoted his aerial um, win percentage, of uh, forty percent since he's been at Argyle, which is uh, you know literally five one last week, of uh, four this week. So he's 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 won two out of five aerial duels. So clearly he's not been brought in for for that. Although being the size he is, even just being able to put someone off, even if you lose the header. But um, he's clearly like a football in centre back, and that's why he's been brought in. And for that, he's been excellent. I used to play with a a CDM who was like nine foot tall, and he would never win a header. And I, I just used to scream at him every Sunday. So I'm like, what? Are you, like, how are you not winning that? You are massive. Um, anyway, enough of that. Um, we'll get on to Hardy's goals collectively, Ben. But what what changed at half time? Obviously, that that saw us. Um, look like a completely different side. You, you, you've asked me on Twitter to ask you about Cardiff's change of shape, so I thought I'd just bundle them in together. What what changed? Well, like I say, I think Galloway coming forward, they outnumbered us in the middle because, of course, they played like a 3-5-2 kind of thing, which, you know, was basically, if you look at the positional map, was just like a flat line across most of the middle of the pitch. Um, and that smothered what we were able to do because the, the team sort of flexes as one. As the fullbacks go forward, then the central, the two central midfielders can step forward. Then the two forwards can go up and support the the striker either by giving him close attendance for knockdowns or going wide to give options. And that's something we should talk about later because that's mentioned in the um, Heidi himself mentioned it in the in the presses um, about what the, they've been working on um, to how to support the striker um, in, this week. That had been shut down, but by by Galloway stepping forward as he did, he ended up on the right wing at one point. He sort of dribbled it out of play, but several times he, he stepped out. And what that allowed to do is then the t JB and Forshaw to then step forward because the man had to either go and meet Galloway or go with the man and cede the space to Galloway. So then that just brought the team up the pitch. And by doing that, all of a sudden we then have the numerical advantage in their fine in their first third, our final third, because of the 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 formation we were playing. Um, and, I, you know, that's why we were all of a sudden, once Galloway was doing that, I don't think it was necessarily the fact that everyone all of a sudden clicked after half an hour. I really do think that was quite pivotal. And whether that was the manager saying that or whether that was Galloway taking that upon himself to do that, I don't know. But that allowed, you know, all of a sudden that completely, that tactic of smothering us in the middle just didn't work anymore. So that's why Bullet, I think, changed to, to, to match us up so that at least... Um, 
they weren't going to lose the the numerical advantage at the back. They could sort of, sort of choke us a bit more because by that point, of course, we had equalised, and it's a very different game. The game state is different. When they're winning, they're quite happy to, um, you know, sort of sort of sit as deep as you want and just choke the midfield. Once we've worked that way through, and then especially once we've equalised, there has to be a different tactic. You now want to hold what you have, or potentially try and hit on the break. So we had to change that formation to stop us overloading in the final third when we got there. Um, the goals. You want to move on to the goals? Yeah. First one was nice. Um, you know, he he it was it like I say there's a phase before where um he was on he was on his toes. The vine saw that, that lift lofted a little ball, sort of cushion volley forward for him. That got the defense on their heels. Um, and then it sort of all broke down from there, even though Hardy couldn't sort of you know finish that chance. It broke again to um to Divine, who he sort of recycled it from out wide, drove in, played a nice little pass. I mean Although it's not the, the the you know, it's not a worldie of a cross. He still needs to thread that through. And then Hardy shows real brains to to take the touch. He does. He could have easily thumped it back across the keeper or gone for power, but just sort of steered it into that corner where there was no bodies in the way. It was a very clever finish. And again, it's it chosen his space. He'd, he'd he'd moved very well to get open and and to be there to be picked out. Made himself available. It was a really nice little finish. The the second goal, his second goal. Um, was well, a bit of a weird one. He said he uh, twice said in the different presses he thought about going down because he was clipped on the heel. And I think that explains why the defender who was in close attendance to him kind of tripped and stumbled and let him go. I think there's a bit of a sort of clash of shin and calf. Um, and then, you know, so you can understand why he got, got away from him. But then why the second centre-back didn't press out to him, I've no idea. Just decided to watch Hardy pivot, turn and smash the ball. Um, that was some was weird, weird decision making. Then I don't know, sort of like heads had gone or something. And if Anik had just sort of stayed still, um, it possibly might have hit him in the face and, and he'd saved it. So I don't think either the goalkeeper or the defenders for that second goal um, showered themselves in glory. Um, but then I think Hardy did a good job to, 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 to do what he did, see the opportunity, seize it. Smash it hard and on target. And that's all you can do is ask the keeper to make a save. And if you're lucky, they're, they're, as bad as Anik was in that particular instance, and just let it through them. But it was just as just just desserts for um, as a reward for for the effort he'd been putting in up to that point. And I actually think I won't go into the goal itself, but I think the best bit of play in, involved in the goals was his take, look, and weight of pass for for Whittaker's goal. I think he's such an intelligent, his speed of thought and his choice of action um, is so underrated. It's very elite. You know, his, the rest of his athletic ability might be sort of average to middling to maybe even not that great, but it's his brain, his decision-making and his movement that really sets him apart at this level that really makes him him useful. You know, he's in the third centile for touches among forwards. You know, so he's like 97% of strikers getting more touches than him. And yet he's so clinical with what he does and effective at what he does. Um, that's, you know, that's a real... Um, boon, boon for Argyle to have a player like that. And we'll discuss probably in a minute whether that's the sort of striker that, that the manager wants going forward. Um, maybe, maybe not. He seemed quite effusive in his praise of him, but then you would be after someone puts in a performance like that. You wouldn't exactly sort of say, well, he's not sort of my man, but you know, he'll do while he's here. Um, so that time will tell. You know, we might get in another striker. We, I think everybody would like to see one, um, even if it's an alternative rather than a replacement. Um, but whether that will be because of a, you know, Hardy's not suited to the system or not, I don't know. I think he's an excellent asset to have. And I think he's established himself as a quality option for any championship side. I think he'd get into at least two thirds of the team in the league as a squad player, if not as a starter, for sure. Yeah, obviously, Hardy's brace sees him sit just one goal behind Paul Mariner in the Argo um, goal scoring charts. Um, I apologise for the stupidly obvious question, Sam, but he's just outstanding, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Um, top Argyle goal scorer of this century um, as well, I think, um, because Paul Watson has scored more overall, but some of his were in the 90s. So, yeah, top scorer of this century. Uh, six away from equaling Paul Watson's total for Argyle. Um, and, and then the next yeah target after that of modern times would be Mickey Evans, who's on 18 something 81 i think so 81, yeah. very yeah very i don't see why not um I, we've got a three-year contract so the rest of this season then two more there is the possibility that if he keeps going like this and bids might start coming in for him in the summer that's the only thing that that might 
stop it happening. But you know, if if he can get if he can get maybe five more this season, that puts him on sixty five. Somewhere Dan LRT is a twitching at the, your suggestion yeah. of big money bids coming in. For well, him. yeah, maybe, maybe, but um, I don't think we'll accept anything this window because I think whilst there may well be some interest for Hardy this window and there will most certainly be some interest for Whitaker, um, I, I don't think anybody's going to offer what they're worth to us because so often, and again, I, I know this podcast has arguably got conceptual enough already without me needing to make it any more conceptual, but. Um, People talk about what is a player worth, and that's a million-dollar question. They're worth what the selling club is prepared to sell them for. As it stands right now, we're in a very good position to stay up, but if we sold either Whitaker or Hardy, our chance, and certainly if we sold both of them, our chance of staying up would drop like a stone. Um, and I think we've got to weight that against the value to the club financially of staying up. So I think for Hardy... I wouldn't be accepting, a, and I still wouldn't go quite as high as eight figures, which is what Dan said on the previous podcast. But I would certainly say seven or eight million would be a starting point for negotiations this January. And even then, I'd, I'd want a bit more. And Whitaker, yep, I think you're looking at double that now. I really am, I, just because of how excellent he's been uh, and how much younger he is. I think him, him, you're looking at double that. Um, but yeah, both of them are fantastic. Ryan Hardy's come on leaps and bounds as an all round player. Um, yes, you know, he doesn't always have the most touches of the ball, but he, he, the work he does pulling up a defender's that position, the work he does running the channels, running off the ball, his pressing is, is, is so much better than it was when he first came to us. It's just been a pleasure seeing him grow with the team over these past four years. Um, you know, yes, he can be a little bit inconsistent. Yes, you know, he, he does miss the odd chance, but for all the good he brings um, and, and for all the the way he's represented the growth and development of this team. I think he's bordering on being a, a club legend, the, the way he's heading. I really do. And hopefully it will go for much longer with us. And yeah, I don't, I don't see any reason why he can't break past that 81 goals and become one of our highest ever goal scorers for the club. I really do think that. Sam Down calling somebody else a club legend is getting clipped. Joe, we, we've... I always tell myself that I don't prepare for these podcasts very well, but I've still got another 10 questions to go. Um, we are 44 minutes in now. Um, so our, our new Pasotti corner that we're going to start can start next week. So apologies there, because uh, I just don't think there's time to fit that in. Just qu- just quickly, obviously, I knew there was, you wanted to, to make a point about certain members of the Green Army eating humble pie. So I'll give you I'll give you two minutes to, to fit that in. You know, I mean, I was very very clear in my stance all the way through last season with my tin hat on that Ryan Hardy deserved a lot more respect on his name than he was getting. Um, And I made it clear whether or not it was the end of season podcasts or whether it was one of the ones we did early season. I made it very clear then that I felt that Ryan Hardy was going to be suited more to the championship than he was going to be to league one or league two because teams were going to play higher lines. They were going to play more aggressive presses. Therefore, he was going to have more space in behind defensive and into channels to run into. That was so evident yesterday. That second goal, that last goal, sorry, Whitaker's goal, is the perfect example of Hardy getting space in behind and running into a channel. Um, The ball to him is brilliant. He does a lot of hard work himself, and then he waits the pass brilliantly for Whitaker to slam it home. Look, we've seen... There's been a number of tweets put out in the last 24 hours. What is it? 186 games, 60 goals or whatever it is, or 180 and 66, whatever the the number is. I know people aren't just coming round to just how good a player Hardy is, but since that day at Carlisle all those years ago, it's been pretty clear that he was going to have an effect on Plymouth Argyle Football Club. Um, And Plymouth Argyle Football Club are a much better club with Ryan Hardy occupying the number nine shirt. Um, look, people are allowed to form their opinions. That's what's great about the game of football. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to stand here and or sit here even and tell somebody who's listening or somebody who reads my tweets that they're wrong on their opinion because an opinion is a wonderful thing. You're allowed to be right. You're allowed to be wrong. There is no right and wrong, but you're allowed to have a differing view to somebody else. Um, and there will be people listening to this who will be sit here saying us that we're talking complete poppycock about Ryan Hardy and he's a dreadful striker and he misses more than he scores and all of that crap. The fact of the matter is, a lot of clubs 
not just in the championship, he, you know, even in League One, League Two, would love a one in three striker. We have got one, and he's our striker for another two and a bit years, three years, however long it is. Finally, he's getting some respect put to his name. And you never know, Steve Clark might finally wake up and realise he's better than Lyndon Dykes. Yeah, we've we've already put out a tweet about the uh, the, the potential Scotland call up. Uh, personally, I'd love to see it. I, I know that he's our only fit striker, and I know that we've got no backup, and I know he would deserve it as well. I know we're biased and we know his goal scoring record, but he works incredibly hard at his game and trying to make the team better and things. It would just be such a reward for him. And what a story it would be as well to start the way his career went and to come to us in League Two. And now to have gone with us on the journey, and we're in the championship now, and then for him to get the call up, I think it'd be a, I think it'd be a great thing for him and his family. And you know, whether or not it comes at the Euros or before it, let's just hope that at some point, even if it's a friendly against Luxembourg, let's just hope that Hardy finally gets the chance to put that that Scotland shirt on. I mean, I won't be stood there singing the Flower of Scotland watching him, but you know, let's just hope he, he gets the chance to represent his country. Yeah, whilst, whilst we're on that big shout out to Sandra Hardy, who uh, Ryan Hardy's nan, who's a big, a big lover of Argo Life over on Facebook. She's a bit of a legend. Uh, love her. Um, literally, like so she's just far too positive if anything. Um, <laughs> lovely woman. Um, anyway, where was I going with that? Um, it would be classic Argo for him to go away in March or whenever it is, and play Luxembourg and break his leg, wouldn't it? Um, on, on that, I don't know. Who, I don't know who's. I don't know who wants this, Ben or Sam. Um, I think Joe's spoken enough. Um, Jack asks, he says, I'll be sensible for once. Um, what do we do about the problem of the backup to Hardy? Whilst we're on Hardy, I'll just mention it now. Obviously, Wayne, as much as we want it, isn't it. And, and Bundu, is he still injured? Is he out of favour? Like, why? And if he's injured, why isn't Freddie on the bench? I think Freddie took a knock against such. I, I'm a little bit baffled because I think, look, whilst Wayne has had some good moments here and there, I think it's pretty evident from the majority of his appearances that he's not championship standard. Bundu, whilst by no means being as good as Ryan Hardy, has had some games where he's performed very well. He's got a, got a couple of goals. Um, really should have got a second at Ipswich to win us the game up there if he wasn't hauled down. And kind of made himself a bit of a menace to defenders. So I'm a little bit baffled. And my initial thought was, you know, OK, He's maybe playing for a bit of a pain barrier after that horrific tackle in the Rotherham game. Um, maybe it's the case of why he's on the bench because he can come on if he really has to, but he's playing through a pain barrier, so we don't want to risk it. And maybe, maybe that is the case, but we didn't bring him on in the Sutton game where some minutes would have done him good. We didn't bring him on at Huddersfield where I think his pace on the counter would have really, really been useful. And we didn't bring him on, obviously, yesterday, whereby it would have been a good chance for him to just get a couple of minutes back in the legs, not a long spell of time, just five minutes back in the legs and work himself back up the fitness. So the Occam's razor, and, um, you know, for any listeners not familiar with Occam's razor, it's basically the principle that the most obvious outcome is the correct one. The Occam's razor answer is that Wayne is just being preferred to Bundu, which I'm a little surprised by, which, you know, Ian Foster had, you know, had, had earned his right to pick who he wants and to, prefer who he wants, but I'm a little surprised that Wayne seems to be being preferred as the second choice striker to Bundu, I have to say, because I think Bundu's been quite a bit better uh, when they've both played. Is this maybe Bundu not fitting the new style? Is he maybe more of a 4-3-3 guy than he is a 3-4-3 a guy? Maybe. Uh, so maybe we could see a surprise exit for Bundu before the end of this window. It wouldn't shock me the way it's looking. Um, and maybe if we bring another striker in, that striker would be second choice slash rotation with Hardy and Wayne would drop back to third choice. And I could kind of see that happening. But I just think it's a little odd that Bundu just seems to be completely out of favour. Um, Wayne, whilst he may be useful in certain systems, I don't, I don't think that's enough of what we want a striker to do. Um, yeah, and isn't quite good enough at this level. So I'm surprised, but like I say, Foster's earned his right. Let's see where it goes. Can I quickly just jump in on that? It'll be very quick. I've, I've, Go on, then. I like I've, been, I've put together, so I won't. I might put it on my own YouTube. Um, some data on the three whoa, strikes. Whoa, whoa, what's this? No, God. <laughs> uh, well, if you want, I just think Joe might sort of like Steve might come out of his ears if I start quoting like you know statistical data about three strikers in in one segment. 
Bundu is an incredibly good striker. Um, he is performing in terms of over his XG. Yeah, go on, Joe. Frown. Uh, basically, a similar rate to Ryan Hardy, whereas Wayne is underperforming. Wayne's sort of underperforming by thirty percent of it. But more than that, he hits the he's hit, hits the target with eighty percent accuracy rate. If he was to hit, um, like, hang on, let, let me get the. So Ryan Hardy has taken sixty six shots this season and hit the target with twenty three of them. Bundu's taken 11 shots and hit the target with nine of them. So he could effectively miss something like 50, 45 shots of the next 50 and still match him for accuracy. He scored two goals out of that, um, which is the same number as Wayne has had this season in the league, despite playing sort of two thirds of the minutes. However, I mean, if just to put something out there, he might be struggling psychologically having just, you know, he looked in a real load of pain to get that, you know, when he got his leg kicked in. And if he's, if he's not ready to put it in where it hurts, it might be that he's just not ready to get back on the pitch. That's potentially something that, you know, that's a real, it might be the first real setback he's had in that sort of sense. But the other thing is, it was interesting, Hardy said in his post-match that um, they've been working on getting the the tens and the fullbacks wide, um, putting the ball in from the byline, as it were. Um, and Foster mentioned that his number nine is key to the whole press. It all starts with the nine. So uh, now that baffles me because I don't see what Wayne offers in any of those situations. I don't see him as a collecting the ball. He, he, he's good. He's good making runs. His, his first pace is quick. He's not rapid once he gets going per se, but he's good playing off the shoulder of the last man. If you get someone out wide and whip a ball in as he's running onto it and meets it. But in terms of sort of getting people out wide, as as was mentioned regarding um, Hardy's first goal, I don't see him as the sort of striker who's going to benefit from that sort of play. And I certainly don't see him as the sort of striker who's... like Hardy wins like 40% of his aerial duels and, and Wayne wins like 32% or something. So he's winning one out of three aerial duels. He's not the guy who's going to hold up the ball. Everyone was complaining about how bad Hardy was at it yesterday. Well, Wayne's going to win sort of like one in six less. And and he's also quite, you know, we anybody can with a pair of eyes can see he's quite weak in the challenge. So I don't see what he adds over Bundu that attracts like attracts him or attracts Foster to him in terms of the what both the striker and the manager have put out in terms of Doesn't it just be like just a similarity to Hardy in the fact that he's he just runs a lot. And I'm not saying that that's all Hardy does. I'm not boiling it down no, to that. But, but we sort of analyzed that person to Hardy than Bundu, right? I don't know if he is because he doesn't. He he runs after people, but it's almost sort of the same pace all the time. Whereas mm. whereas Hardy will arc his run, he'll burst, he will you know worry defenders. You know what that's like when you're playing. But always, Wayne just seems to go at someone like a Labrador, and they know how much time they've got and what to do. You know they easily work their way out of it. I don't see the 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 intelligence in Wayne's play. That's the difference. That's what makes that's what sets Hardy apart. Yeah, it's the speed of thought and 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 his. The, the the nuance in his game that he adds that sort of he sprinkles in that surprises people. Wayne doesn't seem to have that, at least not at this level yet. So I'm I if he if we're not going to bring another striker in, I'm really worried about where the depth is because I don't see Wayne performing. You know, it's a different role to what he's been asked to do under Schumacher, a vastly different role. But if we're talking about we want a striker who's going to be able to hold the ball up when it's necessary and sort of meet balls in from out wide. I don't see that as being Ben Wayne. And, you know, he's, he's good when you've got someone like a Tyreek Wright going down the wing, taking people on all of a sudden the back line is backpedaling. You put a ball across, you whip a ball in sort of into the corridor of uncertainty, he slides in and meets it. He's good at that. He's not good at sort of putting the ball out wide and standing it up to the six yard box and him getting his head on it sort of thing. So it is a really weird situation as Sam alluded to. I think that, there's, there's, we'll probably find the answer in the next sort of ten days as as to what's what's going to happen. Either our ch- our style is going to change quite considerably, and we think, oh, okay, because Wayne does have certain skills. They just, you know, it's a limited skill set, and it might be that we that we find out, oh, we're going to play this way, and it and it really works for Wayne's um, skill set, or it might be that there's just somebody else lined up. It might be that Bundu's had offers, he he's not happy here, whatever it might be, and there's no point playing him and getting him injured. He's, you know, he wants away, and and that might be something. So I think the next ten days will sort of reveal what you know what's going on there. But from the outside, it certainly doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, people that listen to this podcast don't uh, haven't noticed it, but I have, um, which is a bad thing. That we barely talk about our best player, our sixteen goal 
I was going to say striker then. M- marvellous Morgan. Wide forward. Wide forward, that would do. Uh, Morgan Whitaker. Obviously, he posted on um, his Instagram. He said, it's an honour to captain the team today. A massive three points. Up the green army of a little green love heart. Um, question from London-based Argyle fan John Alsop, uh, Joe. Is he the champo player of the season so far? If not, how far off? I, just before we st- before you start, the fact that he's used champo is disgusting. But anyway, carry on. It's, it's, it's an outrageous use of the, of the phrase. Um, he should hang his head in shame. I mean, there's a reason we don't talk about Morgan Whitaker. Because we spent the first two, three months of the season just talking about Morgan Whitaker and we'd exhausted all of our adjectives and um, praise for him. That it's just, it's just on repeat. If you want to know what we all think about Morgan Whitaker, if you haven't listened to them already, go back and listen to the previous episodes. Um, is he the championship player of the season? Uh, he's in the running, isn't he? Um, he would have to be. Um, I hate to be negative. I do still think there are possibly a few players who are better than Whitaker, um, but you know that's not to decry what Morgan Whitaker is all about and just how crucial he is to us. I don't think you certainly can't put a price tag on how important Morgan Whitaker is to us, as much as other clubs would like to. Um, we are not. Million. Yeah, we'll start. We'll start the bidding at twenty million, and we'll go no lower. Um, but look, I mean, he's he's just class isn't he the one thing I, the one thing i do like about whitaker and we we didn't get it i don't i'm going to make a little comparison to graham carey here and we didn't get it with graham carey in his time because graham carey was always in the thick of the action for majority of the game and he was always trying to pull strings whitaker's a different type of player whitaker could be in you know out of the game if you like for 89 minutes and then for one minute he'll just pop up with the most unbelievable bit of brilliance. And that's what sets him apart. And that's what makes him such a gold dust player. You saw it in the Sutton game. I thought he was fairly anonymous against Sutton, to be quite frank. And with just one swing of that foot, it was just utter brilliance. And in Southampton, that's what the disallowed goal at Southampton, we just absolutely bamboozled the defender. That should have stood. And that would have been the that standout was... moment of the game against one of the you know, exactly. promotion rivals promotion candidate exactly and i'm not i'm not using this as an opportunity to knock morgan's work rate or anything i'm just saying that's the type of player he is he is just a box office one in a thousand players that come along that can just produce something from nothing and then they'll be anonymous for the rest of the game now if morgan whitaker is going to be anonymous for 89 minutes of the next 18 games and for one minute in every game is going to pop up with a moment of unbelievable quality I'm all for it, you know, and and what a moment that must have been for him and and his his girlfriend and his family for him to be given that armband yesterday. I mean, what a show of, yeah, you know, support from the manager to to give him that armband. I'm just going to carry on with it, Aaron. Now, yeah, um, you know what a what a show of support that was for him, and it, you know he explains it that Morgan's part of the leadership group and how people can show leadership in different ways. And I'm you know I I buy into that. I can understand what he's what he's trying to say. Um, it's very easy for everyone to have read into it that it was a, you know, a, a statement as to he's not going anywhere. He's our captain sort of thing. Um, I'll just continue to do your job for you, Aaron, given I'm doing it for you in two weeks time. You know, that's that's what it's about. It's, it's he's he's not showing. Well, I mean, he is showing support for Morgan in that respect, but that's not what it was about. It was about showing everyone that Morgan is an important part of the team. He's an important part of the dressing room and he believed that he was going to be the character to to lead the side yesterday. Now, of course, as pointed out by a few people this afternoon, Whitaker's goal came when Joe Edwards was wearing the armband. But I think that's all a bit superficial, personally. Um, I just think he's a wonderful player. Um, I was with a um, Wigan fan, actually, at Huddersfield last week. As you know, Aaron, you, you'd um, met him in, outside the away end at halftime. Um, Huddersfield versus Argyle was a lot more appealing than Northampton versus Wigan for him. And he actually turned to me in the first half um, and said to me how something along the lines of how on what have Swansea done to allow you to have him for a million pounds? Um, and I think we, you know, at some point in the future, we will have to have a podcast 
solely committed to what on earth has Swansea done? Um, be, you know, and not only that, what did they do to this player? Because he showed nothing like what he's showing at the moment with them. There's there's a fundamental flaw with what's gone on there. Um, but look, it's it's a pleasure to have him at the club. We know it's not going to be a rest of his, you know, he, it may well be a rest of his career job. You don't know how much he, he loves the area and things. But look, let's not get away from the fact he is going on to much, much bigger things. And I, for one, when that moment comes, as long as it's not in the next 10 days, um, I, for one, will be more than happy to sit there on a Sunday afternoon watching him tear it up in the Premier League thinking we had a one hell of a part to play in this career and let's enjoy it while it lasts. Let's hope it lasts a lot longer than six months. Um, but, you know, we shouldn't be blinkered to the fact that he's going on to much, much bigger things. I think you've answered your own question there, Joe, in the fact that I think he didn't fit a Swansea because of that quote unquote work rate. I know, I know you didn't you haven't um Possibly. Been, I think you know to play the Swansea way, quote unquote, you have to be a bit more involved and a bit more active. And maybe that's just why he didn't fit in. I think you've 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 covered that pretty well. Um that answers the question from Cardiff based uh Argyle fan Finley Allen, who said, Do you think the fact he was made captain yesterday is an example of the type of man management? already being deployed by Foster. Then do you think that puts to bed any rumours of him leaving in January? Well, I mean, Brentford did that with Tony as well, and I could see him being off anytime soon. But uh, Joe's nodding, so maybe we difference of opinion there. Let me just quickly add on Whitaker that, you know, it's, it's well and good saying, you know, he's he lead in the group, but you have to lead on the pitch as well as a captain. And having what, because I watched the game, the first half, like really, like with great intensity, um, because I was sort of trying to see how bad we were in this 35 minutes. When Phillips got his book in, there's a you know, bit of handbags, and then he went over just to speak to the ref, and Dan Scar came over and Bally Mumba, and he just was like, no. And and re with real authority, said, like, just go away, because it's been dealt with now, the ref's got his card out. And Dan Scar completely, yeah, you know, deferred to him, and I thought, that's really interesting, because, yes, you can lead by example, but sometimes you need a voice on the pitch as well. You can be a leader in the dressing room, but a psychopath on the pitch, or a shrinking violet on the pitch. And it's one thing to, to you know, to, to sort of be a good character, but you also need on the, in the heat of battle, someone who has it. So I thought that was really interesting at 23 years old, he, you know, is a, I'm not, you know, Scar might have just trying to be respectful, but, he, you know, he really seemed to have, you know, to have respected Whitaker's sort of call to be like, no, I'm, I'm handling the situation. So I don't think it's just a, um, a platitude to, that, the, the, that Foster's handed him to keep him here and just to sort of, you know, butter him up. I really do think he, you know, he probably has, although he's a really laid back character, he has a lot more depth to him than perhaps is apparent um, just through, you know, media engagements and stuff. And I think he was, you know, he, he did a really good job as captain on the pitch, certainly, you know, in that, that incident showing up because you could see it on the camera, which you might have missed, you know, in the stadium potentially. Sorry, I know we're strapped for time, but I thought that was important sort of to observe. Yeah, I think this one's going to go over a little bit. Uh, the, the next question I've got is just uh, praise for Mikel Miller. Does anybody want to do that? No? Yeah? Yeah. So, I, I nearly jumped in earlier when uh, when Joe was talking about trajectories of, of careers or being ascendant. And like, Mikel Miller, just how has that happened? You know, he sort of spent a long time in the, you know, if, was it not semi-pro? Because, sort of he's, like the, because he's now staying fit, Ben. That's how it's happened. Yeah. Um, but I mean, like, you know, he... <laughs> He had he he wasn't plucked from obscurity for a good number of years, um, and just he looked absolutely unplayable at times. And again, I know we're talking about Cardiff, but he has it several times this season in several games. Had sort of moments, you know. I've, I've bemoaned the fact that he's always liable for a yellow card, um, and that's maybe something he needs to to sort of work on. But yeah, he's just you know he looks like we've signed him from another sort of bottom half championship side and he's carrying on plowing this, you know, as opposed to being released by the Millers back when, and we picked him up in a lower division. So yeah, he was, he was outstanding and he's sort of really becoming more consistent with that as well. This season's become with the fitness, like Joe says, the consistency has become incredible. He, uh, it, you know, it blows my mind how um, ascendant his trajectory, his career trajectory has been the last sort of six months. Yeah. Three more questions on individuals then really quickly, Sam, um, I'm going to absolutely butcher this name. New goalkeeping coach, Daryl. Flahaven. Flahaven, yes. Um, it sounds like a coastal beach resort in the northeast of England. Um, has uh, has got straight to work on Connor Hazard. 
At least you seem to think so, stating on Saturday uh, that it was, and I quote, Hazard's best game that he's had for us. Uh, solid, despite conceding. Any good? Um, yeah, having had a bit of reflection and, and remembering games in a bit more detail, I think Hull away and QPR away were, were probably better, but Hazard had a very good game. Um, look, I mean, Darren Haven only came in on Thursday, or at least he only got announced on Thursday. So how much of that was actually down to him, I don't know. That's not the criticising him. I'm sure he'll be a very sensible hire, but I don't know how much time on the training pitch he'll have had with Hazard. My inclination of it is that it was more of a foster directive in that he wants him just to keep playing out quickly for the outfielders because goalkeeping coaches, you know, it isn't only goalkeeping coaches who, who deal with the keepers. Obviously, the manager will do as well because he will want that quick that quick ball out, you know, to catch them on the transition. Because I think under Foster, we're going to be a little bit more of a transition-based team. We, we were already to some extent, but maybe going to be a little bit more of a transition-based team under Foster. And having a keeper who can play out fast is very important to transition. So, yes, Connor Hazard did, I think, distribute a lot better. Still not perfectly. There were still two or three moments where I think he clung on to it a bit too long, but distributed much better. Um, and as a result of that, we were able to move the ball up the pitch quicker. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know how much you can put down to Flahaven because he would have only maybe had like an hour or two at most on the training ground with Connor Hazard, but you know, unless he's a very quick learner um, and or a very quick teacher in Flavin's case, I don't know how much it's down to him, but I did notice a change and it was a, whether it was just a Foster thing or a Flahaven thing or whether it was just a, a, a good performance out of the blue and I'm reading too much into why it was certainly a, a good, very good performance in Connor Hazard um, to credit to him where it's due. Anything to take credit away from the previous coaching regime, Sam? Yes, exactly. Well, I muted myself. One of the previous coaching regime who left and was mysteriously ill at Huddersfield turned up in the dugout at Stoke on Saturday. Uh, for any mm. listeners not aware, I mean, you've just completely stolen my next line, which was uh, oh. Raven was uh, announced on Thursday, and nothing else was announced on Thursday because I only read the headlines. Um, Matthew, I'm going to stay with you here, Sam, actually, because you're the only one that seems to care about this and loved it as much as I did. Um, Matthew Soranola has ende endeared himself to the Argyle faithful without playing a single minute after his full-time celebrations. Uh, double question here. Firstly, is that the quickest that you've ever seen a, a player become a fan's favourite? And secondly, what do you make of the signing on paper? It was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, you see players go over and sometimes they give it a little fist pump. Sometimes they just run up a, a bit. And, but only really for like big end of season games do you normally see that. But for a player to, who was an unused sub, who didn't even have a minute on the pitch, to not only do a full run and fist pump and, and lapping up and down the Devonport end, to then look like he was going back to the tunnel and then to do the same up and down the Lindhurst was, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it, you know, in, in a normal mid-season game. Yes, it was a big win to end the winless run, but uh, win this league run, of course. Um, but I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite quite like it from an unused sub. Um, everyone loved it. <laughs> I mean, I, I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. But blimey, if he's like that, if he's like that when he's an unused sub uh, in, in a January mid-season game, I, I, I worry for him if 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 he scores as a last-minute <laughs> winner to get us to get us to Wembley or something. Because I, I don't know quite what what he'll do with himself. Maybe maybe dive bomb into the crowd or something. I don't know, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, very, very interesting um, behaviour from him at full time. And I'm sure he'll endear himself to the Green Army with that sort of passion. Um, yeah, as a signing, um, fairly happy, I think, on paper. Um, uh, look, I, I guess my, my default setting is, is fairly happy because our recruitment team get a lot more right than they do wrong. But yeah, fairly happy based on the evidence. Um, played quite a lot of times for Swansea last season. Russell Martin obviously must, must quite like him and he's a pretty good judge. Um some Swansea fans weren't so keen. It was a bit of a mixed bag, but um, Swansea fans, as the way they treated Michael Duff, let's say, sometimes have rather unrealistic expectations. So I take that with a pinch of salt. And, and ultimately, there were some who, who were positive about him as well. So I'm not going to read too much into the negative comments there. Ultimately, he played 20, 29 times. And I think Russell Martin would, would not have done that if he was a dud. So, yeah, um, positive indications um, from him. Um, yeah, clearly, I think going to be going to be a more of a wing back. So, if there was any doubt that we're now going to be playing free at the back for the rest of the season, I think that's been eliminated. Um, so, yeah, po positive reasons. Um, 
po- sorry, reasons to be positive, if I'm going to say. And I would hope that he'll get his first start at Leeds because he is not cup tied because he's just come from the Belgian League. Matt Butcher not in yesterday's match day squad. How, uh, do you think he's now surplus to requirements? That's a question from uh, Sean. I'm going to couple that quickly with a question from uh, John, who asks, "Where do we need personnel whilst the transfer window is still open? Who's coming in? Who's who's leaving?" I suggest Butcher is potentially surplus to requirements, which I, I don't like talking about players like they're commodities, guys who've put in great shifts for us, and then all of a sudden, oh, we don't need them anymore. But um, given that we've just sort of brought in someone who's potentially fighting for the start in place um, and someone on loan, he's, I don't think he's going to play too much this season, at least, whether he can, you know, with all these loans, they've been brought in because the manager knows they can play his style. It doesn't mean players like Randall, um, Houghton, Butcher can't adjust to his style. He just knows I need to get results going now. I know these players can play this style, so I'll bring these in and it might well be with time. Some of these players can but until he sees it and, and, and knows it, um, he can't necessarily rely on them. So um, I definitely think we're not going to see much of Butcher this season. If he's not happy with that and wants to go and play regular football and there's an opportunity on the table, I don't think the club would stand in his way. He's been a great professional for us and, you know, also a good player. Um, so, I, you know, potentially he goes out. What do we need other than, um, you know, than what we've brought in so far? Um I would say by far and away the biggest issue whoops, is um, a, a striker. Um, just if nothing else, just for depth. I don't think that Wayne is um, the you know good number two. We haven't got a clear what's going on with Bundy. I'm not going to do that stuff to death again because we've already discussed it. But um, if we don't, you know, if Hardy isn't suited to the style perfectly that um, Foster wants to play, we'll need someone who can. Um, and if Hardy is suited. Uh, then maybe we don't have to go out with and find someone quite so good, but we definitely need, I think, an alternative unless somehow, some way, as we said earlier, Wayne manages to fit his skill set into that role um, and 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 sort of pull a worldie and just sort of be exactly the right shaped peg for the hole. Yeah. Lastly, then, Joe. I, I'm annoyingly, I'm going to say quickly. Uh, obviously, Peter Reed back at home park on Friday and and on Saturday. Um, obviously he's been back previously, but in, in roles with, with Wigan, um, it's been a long time coming. I know that I've been saying about it on my, on my personal accounts for quite a while that we should be welcome back to a hero's welcome. Uh, you weren't there, so I don't know what, what use you're going to be here, but just, just how good is it to see the club like recognize, uh, really and see him back at home park. Yeah, it's, it's great to see, um, you know, obviously football's a results business and unfortunately you look back at Peter Reid's results as Argyle manager, they weren't great. However, when you look at the enormous cluster, you know, dumpster fire that he was taking charge of at the time, um, you know, I, I keep going back to it. You give us those 10 points back, back in 2011, I think we finished 15th or 16th in League One that season under Reid, which would have probably reflected a really good season given the turmoil we were in the summer before. I don't. I I said it on my own Twitter that I don't think you can quite put into words um, just what how much gratitude Plymouth Argyle Football Club and the City of Plymouth should give to Peter Reid. You know, obviously, I don't. I wasn't there, so I can't. You know, I can't say whether or not at any point it was mentioned in the crowd that Peter Reid was in attendance or something. But it it would be really. I know he was there as a. I think he was there as a guest of Trevor East, wasn't he? As well as doing the evening with Peter Reid the night before. I know he put up a picture with Trevor East on Twitter um, on match day. Um, I would think, I personally would like to see Peter Reid come back and, you know, even if it's just do the 50-50 draw at half time, just so he gets that opportunity for the crowd to really show what he, what it means to us, because without his stewardship, without his calm head, um, with how he guided the ship for the 18 months or so he was in charge, um, who knows where we might have ended up. It's incredibly special. I'm, you know, I'm thrilled that he he came back. I'm thrilled that he, you know, he, I'm thrilled that he's welcomed back as well. I think that's a really big thing, but I go back to it. I don't think you can quite sum up 
the amount of gratitude, thanks and well wishes we could ever give Peter Reed. I don't think thank you will ever be enough to Peter Reed. So and I think um, the younger generation needs to be told maybe those who didn't sort of experience, you know, that that period. Yeah. Then. You know, that he went yeah, without I mean, wages. He practically ended up out of pocket from being here. Well, well, literally, he's got he sold his, mean, cup, his cup memorabilia for the sake of the club. You know that paid, he, he paid went above and beyond what could possibly be expected from a. You know, you know, it was not really a paid for a the heating bill problem. in the club offices. Paid for staff to petrol to get them in and out of work every day. You know, I don't think you can really. Say, you know, he he didn't have to do any of that. Um, but you know, that's what Argo meant to him and thank you will never be enough from us as a fan base or as a club to for what Plymouth Argo is now because of what Peter Reed helped to do all those years ago. Yeah, here, here. I think there's a there's an awful lot of people that, that we'd be here all night having to thank uh, Peter Reed is is part of that that monumental list of, of people that have got us back to where we are now. But I think that's enough for now. Um, thank you for listening. Subscribe on your podcast platforms and on YouTube if you're watching along. God knows why people do that. Um, make sure you follow us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all of that stuff. Um, and we'll see you soon. Bonjour. <laughs>